My name is Sunshine Menezes. I'm the Executive Director for Metcalf Institute at the University of Rhode Island. Metcalf Institute conducts science training for journalists, communications training for scientists, and we offer public lectures and webinars such as these, all with the goal of fostering informed conversation among public audiences about science and the environment. Today's webinar is primarily intended for journalists who are reporting on the recovery from all of the recent hurricanes that we've had. And um, while we are uh, going to be talking about ideas and, and sources, et cetera, for journalists, we hope that some of this information will even be useful for people who are not journalists, um, but perhaps residents who are um, responding to the aftermath of these hurricanes. So I'm really pleased to present our speaker today, and that is Sarah Watson. Uh, Sarah covered Superstorm Sandy um, and the recovery from that storm for the press of Atlantic City. And um, she knows firsthand what it is not only to what it's like to cover a disaster like that, but to live through it herself. And so she offers a lot of insights from both of those perspectives. Um, I'm also proud to say that, Met that Sarah is uh, an alum of Metcalf Institute's oldest training program for journalists, our annual science immersion workshop, which um, she attended in 2013. And more recently, this year, in fact, she graduated from Rutgers University with master's degrees in both public policy and city and regional planning. She focuses her work now on climate adaptation and coastal resilience. Um, working specifically with communities and especially with regard to stakeholder engagement and risk communication. Well, thank you very much, Sunshine. I, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to do this because um, when I was uh, covering Sandy, I will tell you that all I wished at the time was just for a roadmap of what was going to happen um, because uh, it is a very bureaucratic process and if you are not aware of how government interacts with each other and how things get done, um, especially if you're on the ground waiting for assistance to come, you really are frustrated and you're, it's overwhelming and it's, uh, especially if you're a reporter covering it too, it's, there's a lot coming at you and a lot of things that are moving at the same time and you have to keep abreast of everything. Um, so that was really why um, I approached Sunshine to come up with uh, some of these uh, these workshops is to kind of help some of these reporters uh, that are now new to the beat uh, figure out what's next. And so obviously the goals for these were really to kind of share some of my lessons learned during recovery reporting for Sandy, um, help you all as reporters understand some of the recovery landscape, and that information is also very helpful for people who are working around recovery, but also in people who are going to be those who are needing assistance. And then also help you understand a little bit about the data out there. I took, talked about that in the first webinar. Um, and then also help you identify some of the most important details to re readers. Um, and just to review from the first webinar, uh, I, there are three phases of recovery um, that are really important for us to know about. The first one's humanitarian relief. Um, that one for, uh, uh, for Maria has barely begun. Um, for uh, Irma, it's both mostly complete. Um, for Harvey, it has completed. Um, and in Harvey, they're already on their way to short-term recovery, which is a cleanup process, and that's kind of the same stage for Irma as well. Uh, but this webinar, I'm going to focus specifically on long-term recovery and rebuilding because that is the phase that ultimately is the most important and often is the one that falls through the cracks for covering this because um, really and truly it's the local media that really pay attention to this because it's happening in their backyard. The national media, not so much. They're going to come in and, and do a story occasionally, usually around uh, important dates, like the six-month anniversary or the one-year anniversary to see where things are going. Um, but that information is more toward folks that are not in the recovery area, whereas the folks who are in the area that's under recovery um, have a lot more reliant. They, they need to rely on the media locally for, for information, and that's especially where local reporters come in. Um, so what is long-term recovery? Well. Um, as you can see, it's, it's rebuilding. It's the process where you take uh, and kind of assess what has already happened and how to move forward from there. And uh, it can be a very lengthy process. It can take years. In fact, it's 2017 and there is still long-term recovery going on in Louisiana and Mississippi from Katrina. Um, Sandy is about to hit their five-year anniversary and the long-term recovery groups are still active in this state. Um, and there are still a lot of people who haven't actually moved home. Um, and so that's kind of that thing where a lot of folks don't recognize that disaster recovery takes a lot longer than you think. 
And so um, I want to go over quickly uh, some of the key partners in long-term recovery. Obviously, it's the, you're, you're the first person that first organization that's going to come to mind is FEMA. Um, but also now we're building, bringing in HUD, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, because they handle a lot of the grant funding that comes from uh, the, the disaster supplementals that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, they handle a lot of that, and so that becomes the HUD becomes a very key player in how states will organize and, and put together their plans for how they're going to develop things. I also want to highlight uh, what a group. Um, an organization that's really kind of a collaborative group called the, the National VOAD, the Volunteer Organizations Active in Disaster. Um, they are active in disaster throughout all phases of recovery, um, and I may have talked about them in the previous webinar. They all have, I don't even know necessarily how many organizations there are, uh, but it includes the Red Cross, it includes um, Salvation Army, a lot of the groups that you already know of, but it also includes groups, includes groups like Hope Force International, the St. Bernard Project, um, and those are the groups that also are very skilled in what's known as long, long-term recovery, and that's just what they do. They come in when that long-term recovery process begins, and they help carry that through. And then one of the other big key players is state and local government. And then I want to talk about the other essential key player in all of this, and that's the long-term recovery groups. These are groups that will form in about, a, about two months or so, maybe a month, depending on where they are, um, and depending on the disaster. And these are the locally driven organizations that are kind of uh, uh, organized through VOAD and through FEMA to some extent. But they are the ones that are on the ground. They're in the counties or the three counties or, or, or even cities um, that are the groups that are on the ground figuring out where the needs are on the individual level. And they help direct funding for... Um, particularly through uh, if it's philanthropy money or it's uh, nonprofit money coming in, and they are the group that kind of ultimately come out and if you are not able to hire somebody on your own, either if because you didn't get a grant or you didn't have insurance money, they are the ones that actually connect you as a, a storm victim to the organizations that are doing that work by volunteering or like Habitat for Humanity. Um, the church groups that come in, uh, there's a number of church groups and, and groups of uh, faith-based groups that their big mission is, a, you know, a, one of the big ones in, in New Jersey, actually, after Sandy was uh, the Mennonites that came in, and all they did was go door-to-door -door and help people uh, tear out floorboards and tear out uh, the wall and cut and get everything ready for demolding and ready for that rebuilding process, and they do that without uh, any funding needed. So... These groups are essential for reporters to connect with because one of the things that the long-term recovery groups may not be really good at is telling people they exist. And in fact, I actually was asked to serve on the Atlantic County uh, long-term recovery group in New Jersey after Sandy because I could help them figure out how to get the message out. Um, so they are very helpful for you to figure out for just finding stories. Um, they are great for connecting you to people that you need to highlight in your stories. They're also helpful for filtering out and, and figuring out who would be best to go in front of the media because not everybody may be ready to talk on the media or may not be able to handle the attention. Um, and they're also really good at just sitting with you off the record and explaining what the process is and what to expect. Um, so if you're a reporter, get to know your long-term recovery group and know that they're going to form um, it's, it differs in who actually organizes it and who's going to be the one charged with it. So that's the group that, that's the thing that you're going to have to figure out locally if you're, if you're doing things in Texas or, or Florida or elsewhere. Um, that's going to be the challenge is to figure out who that person is and go from there. Um, but if it's, you know, I've seen them done locally from, you know, in Atlantic County, in Atlantic County New Jersey. It was done through the Salvation Army in, in South Jersey. Um, and I've also seen Hope Force International come in and, and be the one that chaired that through that process. So um, the next thing we always like to talk about is money because money makes the world go round and reporters uh, very obvious, very clearly and very importantly focus on how money comes around. Um, who pays for recovery uh, if you're not able to do it yourself? Uh, one of the things that we see right now is a lot of donations going into nonprofits and NGOs, um, including the Red Cross or other uh, recovery groups. Um, and that money kind of comes through into the system and it gradually gets filtered out and not everybody really understands how it's getting used. Um, when it's going to a larger organization, it usually comes down through grants to the local organizations and then gets filtered through, often through the long-term recovery group or other organizations that are working in that, that field. 
Um, and then you also have philanthropy organization funding. We saw a lot of that after Sandy, and they, they made group, they made grants to other nonprofits to do work that perhaps um, long-term recovery funding or disaster supplemental funding was not covering. Um, for example, in, in New York and New Jersey, um, uh, philanthropy funded a lot of uh, storytelling projects and you know different types of what we would refer to, what I would guess I would refer to as long-term resilience or climate adaptation work in certain communities to help build them forward to the process rather than just building back the way that they were. And then finally, the really big one uh, that everybody's going to be paying attention to is that federal funding coming through the emergency spending bills, which are often known as the disaster supplementals. One has already been passed for uh, Harvey. I know that another one is, is in the works for Irma and possibly going to include additional funding for Harvey and most likely also Maria. Um, and those can be huge. And following how that gets developed is a really important process. But then also finding out how that is getting spent and getting out to the people in need is another really big key part of your job if you are working as a reporter in this area. So um, I just went through all of those. How does disaster supplementals work? Um, well, first, when you see those, the, the towns going around saying, uh, please report your damage um, to the town, uh, what they're doing is they're trying to find out what their need is. They're trying to assess the damage and figure out how much uh, money that they need from FEMA, but then also from the larger picture of how much they're needed overall and what FEMA disaster uh, funding does not cover. And FEMA, and what I mean by that is like FEMA already has their group coming in and figuring out how they're going to get money to people, but do they need it more than they already have been allocated for the year? Um, the next stage is Congress, and obviously I'm skipping over a lot. This is a lot more complicated than it looks. Um, that need ultimately gets sent up to how that bill is shaped. Congress passes the emergency spending bill. Um, it's kind of a challenge if they pass it immediately because maybe they haven't completely assessed what the overall need is. Sometimes they need to wait a few months to figure out what that need is and what they need to actually do. And because what they may have the will to spend may not be what the actual need is. Um, so that's, that, that, that's kind of a challenge in there. Um, and then really skipping over a lot, uh, and this is also where uh, you as a reporter is going to come in just to make sure you're watching for when this happens, is that the states will develop plans for how they will spend their allocation. After Sandy, um, there was kind of this whole, uh, I guess, a clamor for everybody to come together and put anything and anything you might be, you think that you might need. How many houses in your community might need to be elevated? How many uh, different areas need to have repairs done to protect from future flooding? Um, what kind of planning does your community need to do? Um, all of these sorts of things that are around and for not just recovering from the disaster, but also preparing for the next disaster or future disaster. Um, and so they're kind of in that process of figuring out what they need and what kind of projects could be funded under this that would have really good important impact in the areas that are affected and so when that comes together the states then will develop these large plans and so um, these plans can take a long time to put together and it kind of depends on who's putting it together sometimes it's the contractor putting it together sometimes it's uh, actual state people putting it together state workers putting it together so um, kind of figure out how that's happening where you are and how that's going to work and, and see if you can follow along um, it can be a very chaotic process, just, just so you have a heads up on that. Uh, and then most importantly, the states develop the programs once uh, they figure out that they've been approved for their allocation and they have their plan developed. Um, they have to send it usually to HUD to have approval. Um, HUD usually works with the states as they're developing it so that they pretty much know that they're going to have approval. They don't want to submit something that's going to get rejected right away. Um, so the big thing is the states are going to develop their programs and issue contracts because they cannot do it in-house. It, it, it takes a lot to spend a billion dollars, believe it or not. Um, so they're going to issue contracts to companies that will help them carry out that spending process. If you are a reporter covering long-term recovery, you want to know everything about this process. This will take a ton of time to figure out. Uh, you're going to be watching a lot of sausage making in the process. but Keeping an eye on how that's going on will tell you down the line of what's important to your readers because they, they're going to hear that and they're probably going to read your story that says, oh, they just passed however million uh, or however billions of dollars in funding, where's my money? Um, and so just simply understanding how that works and how long that's going to take is really important to helping people set their own expectations because most of the time folks, because they want to go home and they want their life to return back to normal, they're going to be sitting there wondering, where's my money? Um, 
So again, what do your readers need to know? Uh, what's really important is what kinds of programs are proposed and how they will specifically help people. They want to know what's going to help them in particular. Um, and so there may be a lot of really small programs that maybe have a very small amount of money at attached to them. They may actually be really important to write about. Um, the other really important thing is who's eligible? Who can, who can be eligible for a grant? Um, who can be eligible for a specific type of loan to help them rebuild their house or elevate their house or um, figure out how to get uh, funding for a community to, to build a seawall or build some sort of uh, stormwater protection that reduces flooding in the future. Um, if people are not eligible for assistance, they're going to want to know what their other options are. Usually their other option is the long-term recovery group and going through Habitat for Humanity or other organizations that are coming together to build stuff. Um, sometimes it also explains uh, those explainers for how federal funding trickles down to the ground level is really important because people have literally never thought about that. And in fact, local governments or state governments may not have even thought about how that money from uh, you know a built couple billion dollars of extra money going into the state is going to trickle down to the individual person. Um, what's also really important in your stories as you're writing about this is talking about how long this process takes. And, and as I said before, it takes a lot longer than anybody expects and a lot longer than anybody wants. Disaster recovery is really chaotic and really complicated. Everybody wants to find a way to streamline it. And the sad part is there probably is never going to be a really good way to do that because in the end, you're talking about things on the ground level and everybody's situation is different. And last, phone numbers. Everybody needs phone numbers. Uh, a lot of folks like to give web addresses and email addresses. Not everybody uses a computer. Um, and not only that, not, not, only, not only do they not use a computer, if they had a computer, they would not even know how to navigate a website. Um, I remember actually one of the most important places for folks to get through the disaster recovery process was the library. And the librarians were helping people figure out how to read a website and how to navigate the website and how to apply for assistance because they couldn't do it anywhere else at that point. Um, but phone numbers, if you can put them in the paper, if you're, especially if you're a print reporter, if you are a broadcast reporter, putting it on a screen for longer than about five seconds so people have a chance to write it down, really important for those phone numbers, especially for phone numbers that reach human beings, not phone trees. Um, and with that, I will be very happy to take any questions. Great. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, that is obviously, <clears throat> excuse me, um, a very fast overview of a lot of information. So um, if everyone, anyone has questions, please submit them via the, the chat bar. Um, I'll start things, though, with a question, Sarah, which is, um, are there any um, specific stories or types of stories that you think journalists um, should be looking for at this point? Or were there stories that you really wanted to see at certain stages of recovery in your experience that, that you didn't see? Like, what would you advise for people to think about here? Um, probably the hardest story for me to write, um, and it was one that I think is without question the most important. Um, is writing about the people who are already kind of falling between the cracks, the people who are already very poor, um, may not speak English as their first language, may not be in an English-speaking household, um, but you know they may have, you know, six months down the road, they may have gotten their their actual living situation in that they have a place to go, but they lost all their belongings and they have no idea how to get a mattress or a chair, um, and so. There, there are a couple of really important things when reporting about this and that you need to go through folks who are working on the ground already and trying to help find those folks aid. Um, sometimes the school districts are really great places to do that because children still go to school and the teachers and the teacher assistants are really aware of what's going on in everybody's house. And so it's important to one, verify that the situations are legitimate, but also verify that the folks that are willing to go on the record, and three, that they're able to talk to a reporter and understand that media attention may be stressful, may be adding to their stress. And so it's important to kind of filter out uh, who would be a good candidate for that. And one of the things that I did was I built really good relationships with people working in the school districts, with people who were working in long-term recovery, 
uh, through kind of the long-term recovery group, but maybe not part of that, to help get the get into the situation, get into what was going on into neighborhoods and individual households to verify what was going on and then have them prepared for what was going to happen. Because a lot of times, a lot of reporters coming in from out of town who maybe were not in the area were reading my stories and seeing the names of people and going to their houses. And that was something that was actually adding to a lot of stress. Um, and, and also New Jersey has a lot of folks who like to play with out-of-town media, especially in Atlantic City. So um, they like to kind of give them a different story than what's really happening. And, and that does happen, unfortunately. So that's why if you're coming in from out-of-town, it's important to, to maybe find a place where you can verify folks, um, but also verify that they're, they're able to have or, or they're able to accept and be part of that, that attention. Um, but really importantly, when you are covering disasters, you're really covering initially that humanitarian relief and maybe the short-term recovery. The long-term recovery really falls off the radar. And so, but the long-term recovery is the marathon part. And that's, you know, you're getting to mile 22 at the marathon and you're about to hit the wall and everybody's hitting the wall at the same time. And so it's important to bring back attention to that and help people understand what's going on. And that all is not well just because it looks like the debris has been picked up. So... Yeah, those are the stories that were really important to me. Gotcha. And you, I mean, you touched on this a little bit in, in this answer, but uh, I'd like to explore it a little more. How about for those reporters who aren't local, who are parachuting in and out um, to cover these stories, um, do, do you have additional specific suggestions for them? Yeah. Um, I would, when you're, a lot of times we're mining, you know, when you're coming in from out of town, and really, I've done that too, by the way. Um, so I, I know what that's like. Um, a lot of times you're reading the local media to find people to highlight, uh, but perhaps rather than finding individual people and perhaps not going to, you know, a lot of times we'll just go to door to door because that's, that's what's natural to us. Um, two things on that. When you do go to door to door, when you do door to door in the neighborhood that has been uh, affected by a disaster, um, recognize that there are a lot of people also doing the same that are potentially scammers or potentially folks trying to sell services and folks are really weary of people knocking on their door by that point and so it might be more helpful to go through when you're when you're reading the stories look for that long-term recovery look group look for those aid organizations that are working in those areas and connect to people through them um, and, and do some legwork ahead of time. I know that sometimes you get the assignment and you have a day to show up and get it done, and maybe you don't have time to do that, but maybe, uh, you know, find the social services organizations that are working and kind of connect through them so that they can kind of say, you know, that person's been in the media a lot, and, and so they're probably getting a little tired of sharing their story over and over and again, over again because it does, the stress does accumulate. Let's give you somebody else that would be a good person to, to work with. Um, so that's really one of those key is just kind of be aware of what's going on that and that's really kind of the same throughout all, all areas but also remember that people do want to share their stories because they don't want folks to go through what they just did and so um, you're, I don't think you're gonna have trouble finding people to go on the record but it's also just being aware that if, if somebody's writing about them or they did on TV they've probably already been on TV or have been written about a gajillion other times so um, maybe there are some ways to help figure out how to, you know, mitigate that stress, but also find fresh voices. Great. Um, I wonder, so <clears throat> there was one of, and I, um, I can't see the specific slide, but in one of your slides when you were explaining the process, you know, in terms of how the money is allocated, um, this one, yeah, you said, um, you know, when you got from Congress passing the emergency bill to states developing plans that there's so many steps in between that that you're really skipping over. Could you um, elaborate a little bit more on that? Um, I don't know the details of it. I think, okay. it's, I, I think it's pretty much federally driven and that, and it's federal and state driven. It's pretty high level and that they're coming together to say, all right, what are our priorities? As that's already happening, they've already begun that request down to the communities and to organizations that know what's going on. And so mm -hmm. they kind of have a pretty good idea of what's going on. And then it just becomes a process of, all right, let's, let's, what are our priorities about what are our needs and what can we do with this? So, and that, that's pretty high level and how that, that's actually occurring. So then they, um, and sometimes they'll have, 
um, a contractor helping them work to develop the plan and write it. And so it's uh, it, it's that process in there that a lot of the, the it, it's what I refer to as the sausage making part. It's not, not pretty, but it, it has to get done. And so another um, question related to something you said is that, um, and then also your specific expertise is in terms of these um, these plan planning for future disasters and you know building resilience at the community level. Um, what are the kinds of in, in very broad terms, or if you want to offer specific examples, what are some of the things that um, reporters might be be looking for, um, or what are the, some of the things that the communities might be trying to do that is either really best practices or some new stuff based on the emerging science that's out there? Uh, that's a really great question. I feel like I could write, like, you know, do a few webinars on that alone. <laughs> uh, very quickly, um, when, you know, if, you're, if your community is in the National Flood Insurance Program and if your state is in the National Flood Insurance Program, your state is supposed to have a law talking about um, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's an act. It's usually a, a legislative act, and then the regulations get written into that. Um, and so you're required to have, uh, if your house is substantially damaged or your property is substantially damaged, which means the damage is equal to or greater than 50% of the structure's value before the disaster, um, you're required to bring that house or that structure up to the most current elevation plus at least one foot of additional elevation, which we, we refer to as freeboard. Um, not all states will enforce that um, when they're rebuilding from a massive disaster. In Louisiana, after the Baton Rouge floods, um, they did not enforce that. So that is going to be something that's really important to look at. It's only required in the areas that are mapped as flood zones. Um, New Jersey enforced it. Uh, the problem with the one foot of freeboard is that it does not include for uh, future conditions. And so some communities will actually put in their ordinance um, as people are, you know, just before folks start really rebuilding that you're required to have three feet of freeboard or two feet of freeboard, that extra additional elevation which protects from future floods. Um, and so that's something to really watch for at the municipal and the county level to see if that's actually happening. Um, are people being forced to rebuild not just to the, the most current building codes, but to building codes that exceed current standards? Um, and so that takes a lot of leadership and a lot of, uh, um, in my opinion, a lot of guts to do because it does make people very angry because they just want to go back to things the way that they were. But it's the opportunity to bring things forward and help things become more resilient. Um, some other areas to look for are um, are communities considering designated areas, designating certain areas that are particularly flood prone as buyout areas. That's those areas that have been flooded repeatedly. We, we were hearing a lot about the severe repetitive loss or the repetitive loss properties in, in the news, especially regarding Texas and other states. Um, so our community is saying, you know what, this is an area where we realize that this is an opportunity where we can establish a buyout program. And that happened in New Jersey and New York. In New York, I don't know how well it was received, but in New Jersey, there were areas that, that, were, that were subject to a lot of tidal flooding that were bought out completely. Um, and, and in Texas, there are areas that have, a, they have a pretty big buyout program in Harris County even. Um, and so are they going to designate that money for, designate some money for those buyouts and how that process is going to happen? Um, so I think those are the two big ones that I would really focus on. That's great, thanks. Another question that came through is, um, what's the best way to distinguish your reporting from the stories that everyone is cranking out? Oh, that's a really good question. <laughs> um, I, I'm the person who I would see the pack and how they were writing, and I would just go write a different story. Um, I, I just always kind of saw stories that were kind of different than other folks were writing. Um, but more importantly, what would really distinguish your reporting is if you can really explain policy and bureaucracy at a level that people who are not exposed to bureaucracy and, and policy can really understand, and so that they can get the larger picture of why their situation is the way it is, 
but then also begin to see ways out of it. Other ways to distinguish your reporting is to use really good science and use really good science communication skills to explain what's going on and how things can move forward and how things are going to change um, and how things might change. Um, and so even if you just have a really good understanding of the climate science for your specific area and how flooding might change and how to explain that probability in a really, really good way that isn't just repeating the numbers of the way the scientists perhaps talk, but other, you know, figuring out the science of science communication, because there is a really big science. Unfortunately, I don't have time to explain all of that today. Um, but understanding the science of science communication and the science of risk communication, incorporating that into your story. Um, perhaps writing about the stories that seem like they're just like the, the tiny little ants in, in the area, but realizing it that if you write about somebody in a very uh, mundane situation where uh, things are not good, you know, they're trying to figure out what's going on, a lot of folks, will, that'll really resonate with a lot of folks because they'll realize they're not alone. Uh, writing about issues that don't necessarily seem like they're part of disaster recovery. Uh, the mental health issue is a really big one. The public health issues are really big. Um, how things affect school children and how children are affected. Um, those are really interesting stories and, and especially because sometimes people just really want to talk about how their life has been changed. Um, sometimes the stories and disasters are just how the schools have really helped out uh, and helped become that community center to move forward. How the churches have worked together and have worked in the community to bring things together and move things forward. Um, finding uh, some of my favorite stories that I, I know exist out there um, are the neighbors that just kind of said, you know what, I need to help my other neighbors. And so I'm going to help put together a little group that's going to help clear out uh, houses and start figuring out what people need to move forward because I know that they can't afford it, but I can't. Um, so those kinds of stories, and they're all over the place. It's just kind of getting off social media and just going out and, and knocking on doors and that, that old fashioned shoe weather reporting. Thanks, Sarah, and we'll see you all later. Bye. Bye.